just going to give people the chance to trickle in. Okay, thank you for joining us, everybody. And welcome back, Dr. Joe Schwartz. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Well, of course, you know from listening to me uh, previously that my real passion, of course, is, is chemistry. And uh, I regard it as the central science, the one that links all the other sciences together, uh, because it is the study of matter and the changes that matter undergoes. And matter, of course, is anything that occupies space and has mass. So we're talking about everything in the world. I find it exciting. Uh, not everyone shares that view. There are those who think that chemistry is, is boring, but uh, I think that they're wrong. And if it's presented in the proper way, it can be very interesting and very satisfying. But there's another problem that we face when we talk about chemistry, and that's the impression that people have that uh, chemists just like to blow things up, or if not, then just think about what new cancer-causing additive can be put into the public's uh, food supply. Unfortunately, we uh, have to deal with this image problem, which is really not, not realistic. Now, I've been dealing with this for, for a long time. Now, I remember when uh, my, my oldest daughter, uh, who now has five children. <laughs> but when she was uh, first uh, going into school, I think it was in grade two, I asked her to go to the school library and to uh, bring home a book about science that we could then read together. Because of course, I was keen on getting her interested. So she did come home with a book that the librarian had uh, recommended to her. And I looked at the book and the cover had this picture on it. So that was already quite off-putting. What was this book? It was Mad Scientist Riddles, Jokes and Fun. This is what the school librarian thought was appropriate for uh, <laughs> you know, a, a second, uh, grade two kid. I looked into some of this. I mean, things like, like uh, why does a math scientist like sales? Because he's 50% off himself. Or what must you never do after chemistry class? Lick the spoon. Or uh, one that's not bad. How many drops of poison can the math scientist put into an empty test tube? Well, the answer is one because after that, of course, it's no longer empty. So that's sort of clever, but you get the gist of it. Uh, it's quite demeaning towards science and, and chemistry specifically. And this is what implants the, the image in people's minds that chemicals are something that should be feared uh, and that the word chemical is essentially a synonym for, for toxin. And they worry about all of the chemicals that they encounter in their daily life. But there's just you know, so much misunderstanding here because uh, acetic acid is looked upon as a dastardly chemical. But when you call it vinegar, then it becomes a, a great environmentally friendly cleaning agent. The moral here, is that chemicals are not to be feared, nor are they to be worshiped. They are to be understood. Now, it is true, and I, you know, I will uh, ascribe to this notion, that, that um, chemistry is the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde science. But of course, chemicals don't make any decisions. People make decisions, and they can make good decisions or poor decisions. Uh, obviously, the extract of the opium poppy uh, which contains morphine, can be used to dissipate pain, which is most welcome. Or the morphine can be converted to heroin, which is a terrible social scourge. But that molecule of morphine in that opium poppy doesn't make a decision on where it is going to travel. It's people who make that decision. 
And therefore, understanding of chemistry is what is really needed. And it is sorely needed because of course, our world is composed of chemicals. That's not a dirty word. It's just a descriptor of the basic building blocks of matter. We are surrounded obviously by chemicals. The cleaning agents that we use are chemicals. The medications that we take are chemicals. The dyes that we use to color our clothes are chemicals of all sorts. I mean, obviously a blue coloring is not composed of the same substance as a, as a red one. Well, talking about dyeing, the very fabrics that are dyed, whether it be cellulose acetate or rayon or nylon or polyester, these are obviously a whole class of chemicals. So is the food that we eat. It's a very complex mixture. I mean, what you're looking at here is a collage of hundreds of different naturally occurring substances. Yes, naturally occurring because nature is also made of chemicals. That aroma that you get when you're walking through a forest is composed of dozens of different compounds that are exuded by trees. So I've long been trying to get you know, this message uh, out there. And sometimes successfully, believe it or not, I even made it into the National Enquirer. Not exactly the New England Journal of Medicine or the Journal of the American Medi uh, Chemical Society. But it's interesting that I don't know someone somewhere saw something I'd written or heard, and it somehow it got into the National Enquirer in this little uh, paragraph where they reveal to the world that everything is made of chemicals. Well, of course it is. So chemical is not a dirty word, but of course we do have to think about how we use these substances because the road diverges and it depends which path we are going to take. That's what we have to think about. We make decisions based upon chemicals all the time. Let me give you a simple example. You decide in the morning whether or not you're going to put margarine or butter on that toast, chemical decision. You'll even decide whether or not that toast should be white bread or whole grain bread. What kind of juice to drink? Does it contain sugar? And then the coffee that you're gonna have. Well, decisions are made there too. Is it going to be filtered coffee? Is it going to be French press, espresso? Those have quite different chemical compositions and uh, quite different effects on, on physiology. Coffee actually has, has uh, received a lot of press over the last few years, some of it negative, but uh, it really has turned positive in the last little while because we have had all kinds of studies coming out showing that uh, drinking anywhere up to about three cups of coffee a day is actually beneficial to, uh, to health. It actually can reduce the risk of, uh, of cardiac problems. But again, these are chemical decisions that, that we make and we decide what we're going to eat. Are we going to eat that French fry? I mean, it tastes pretty good, but what does it do to our uh, insides? Uh, I think most people would agree that it would not be a good idea to make that a common part of, uh, of the diet on a regular basis, but once in a while, there is no issue. Again, we know that based upon scientific studies. We even have to decide how we're going to cook our food. Is it going to be in a copper pan or will it be uh, stainless steel? Will it be uh, something that is coated with Teflon? Is it going to be cast iron? Uh, or what about aluminum? People are concerned about that because they've heard of a connection between aluminum and Alzheimer's disease. Well, this is uh, not a legitimate uh, connection. Uh, the truth is that aluminum does build up in the brain of Alzheimer's patients, but it is not the cause of the disease. It is a consequence of the disease. Other decisions, what are we going to do with all the garbage that we produce? All of those plastic bottles, which should be recycled, but often are not. So this is why I say that, that uh, uh, chemistry is the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde science because it can be extremely useful for us 
but it can also cause problems. That's why I keep emphasizing that what we need is education. We need to, to teach kids how to think scientifically, how to be critical thinkers, and the basic tenets of science. Now, I'll tell you a little story about my history, how I got into this, uh, because I think it makes for a uh, fascinating little account. It all happened, believe it or not, through some magic. And I was back in grade six in old Logan School on Darlington Avenue. Some of you may know that. Of course, it's no longer there. None of the schools I've gone to are there except uh, McGill. Uh, I was invited to a birthday party. And at that party, uh, my friend's parents had hired a magician to entertain us. Turns out he wasn't very good. And most of the tricks he carried out were eminently forgettable and I've long forgotten them. But there was one that was not only memorable, but life-changing. <clears throat> he showed us three short ropes and he said that he was going to use a magic chemical to link these together into one rope. And he proceeded to do that. He reached into his pocket, he pretended to sprinkle <coughs> this invisible magic chemical on the ropes and magically they turned into one rope. Now, of course I knew even back then that there was no such thing as an invisible magic chemical. I knew that this was done somehow by sleight of hand, by you know, some sort of trickery. But what caught my attention was the wording that he used because he said magic chemical. He didn't say abracadabra or alakazam or hocus pocus. He said magic chemical. I, I had never heard those words put together before. It interested me enough to make me go to the school library and take out a book on chemistry and take out a book on magic. And I have followed both of those ever since. And you might think that this is a, a rather strange combination, but it actually isn't. Because magicians really are scientists. A magician is the scientist of the stage. Everything he or she does is done by perfectly explicable scientific means. It's just that the audience is not privy to those means and you try to hide it because you want to present it as a puzzle to the audience. Let them think about how this may be done. In science, it's quite the opposite. We present puzzles, but then we also present explanations. But to someone who doesn't go behind the scenes, who doesn't look for the explanation, then science or chemistry in particular can look magical. When you pour two liquids together, you get a color change. If you have no idea of chemistry, of acids, bases, indicators, for example, it looks like absolute magic. So this is why I followed both of those ever, ever since. And uh, pretty soon I found that you really could do some magical things with chemistry. With a couple of friends of mine, we used to go up to St. Joseph's Oratory. Now don't tell this story to anyone. I'm just telling it to you. We used to go up to St. Joseph's Oratory and uh, put some silver nitrate into the holy water. Well, let me tell you the beauty of this little experiment. <clears throat> Pilgrims come and they dip their finger into the holy water and they cross themselves on the forehead. Then they go into their church. Well, the interesting thing about a silver nitrate solution is that when you put it on skin and then you expose the skin to sunlight, the silver nitrate turns into metallic silver and it has this dark color. So these people would uh, cross themselves on the forehead, go into the church and when they came out, the sunlight would hit their forehead and all of a sudden these indelible black crosses would develop. And we were there watching from the bushes snickering away at this as these people thought that they had seen a miracle. Well, of course they had seen a miracle. It was a chemical miracle. So this is the kind of thing that really got me interested, but there were other factors too. There was a TV program back then, I Dream of Genie. 
It was a very cute little program. And uh, the genie originally came out of a bottle. And I remember thinking back then, how did they do this? How did they make that smoke come out of the bottle? Now I realized that the genie did not come out of the smoke, that that was made by you know some superimposition of the picture, special effect. But I wondered how they made the smoke come out of the bottle, which it clearly did. I had another reason for liking this uh, program. Uh, it starred Barbara Eaton, and uh, I was kind of fond of her and thought maybe I could grow up and get to know her better, but that never did happen. But I did eventually find out what the chemistry was here and how the smoke came out of the bottle. Incidentally, Barbara Eaton starred with Larry Hagman in that, in that show, who later on, of course, went on to become JR in Dallas. And uh, most of you will remember that show. It was a great show. And who shot JR? Uh, tantalized people over a whole summer until we found, found out. That was a classic episode. <clears throat> anyway, it took um, me until graduate school to really learn how this was done. It was a very simple bit of, uh, of chemistry and it relied on hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. <clears throat> now hydrogen peroxide, which you're probably familiar with because it's a commonly used uh, antiseptic and disinfectant, is a relatively unstable compound and it breaks down into water and oxygen. That happens generally quite slowly, unless you have a catalyst. A catalyst is a substance that speeds up a reaction without taking part in the reaction itself. Well, manganese dioxide is such a catalyst. So if you take hydrogen peroxide and you add a little bit of manganese dioxide, the peroxide breaks down quickly to form water and oxygen. And this generates a tremendous amount of heat, enough heat to cause the water to turn into steam. So what they had in this genie flask was two containers. One contained the hydrogen peroxide, the other contained the manganese dioxide. When the container was picked up and tilted, the two chemicals mixed and the steam came out of the bottle. And then of course, they just superimposed the image of Barbara Eden on that uh, steam. So this, this is the kind of stuff that got me interested. And by the time that uh, I went to the New York World's Fair in 1964, which was a, a great event, I was already primed to appreciate science. And I was looking forward to visiting the DuPont Pavilion. Because DuPont at that time, of course, had a slogan, better living through chemistry. And uh, the DuPont Pavilion really was um, excellent. They had a, a show and it was sort of a, a, a mini Broadway type musical where you had dancing molecules tell the story of chemistry, especially about plastics. The happy plastics family was the theme. And everything in that auditorium where the show was performed was made of some kind of DuPont material, whether it was nylon, which was, was uh, uh, DuPont's classic invention, or, or Dacron polyester or some sort of polyurethane. And of course, they talked about this, and it was all very well performed musically. So, um, you know, by, by, by this time, by... Uh, 1984, I was, I was you know, well, uh, well into, uh, into chemistry and I could appreciate uh, what uh, I was seeing uh, in, uh, in, you know, at, at the World's Fair. And uh, this was instrumental in, in getting me to eventually go into chemistry, study it, and hopefully pass the knowledge on to others. Well, passing the knowledge on to others, of course, took many forms. I've been teaching at, at McGill since 1980, which was also this, the year that um, along with a couple of colleagues, I was asked to put on a sort of a, a science show, a mini science museum at a pavilion at Man and His World. 
Expo 67, of course, was just a, a fantastic event. And after it was over, most of you will remember, the city of Montreal tried to keep the spirit of this going uh, under the guise of an annual man in his world exhibit, which is kind of a scaled down version of Expo 67. Well, during Expo 67, the Bell Telephone Pavilion was a very popular one because it had a 360 degree movie. Well, that was really, really good. Uh, it was very, very well done. Uh, you, know, you, you felt like you were in the movie because you were in the movie. You were totally surrounded by, by the screen. Anyway, after Expo, uh, this pavilion uh, was left and it was taken over by UNESCO which is the United Nations scientific arm. And uh, they kept the movie, the Cinema 360 going, but they wanted to couple it with an exhibition because there was an exhibition hall in this building. During the expo, when it was the Bell Pavilion, uh, you had the movie. And after the movie, people ex exited into an exhibition area where all of the Bell equipment was uh, was shown. And that, of course, now was empty. So they wanted some something to fill it. So they asked us to mount sort of a, a mini science museum, demonstrations, etc. And we organized this. We hired students to put on demonstrations. And, you know, we did the classic things, combustion experiments, color changes, etc. We had a stage and uh, there was uh, an audience that assembled, um, you know, every, uh, every hour or so, uh, several hundred people looked on to this uh, little show. Uh, actually, it was quite good, I must say. We taught these, uh, uh, these students to be performers. You know, they, they would uh, tell the story of the demonstrations that they were doing. And uh, this was done over two summers, 1980 and 1981. And I think we totaled about 400,000 uh, people who, who saw this. So that was pretty, pretty satisfying. At one show, we had a rather uh, exalted audience because Prime Minister Trudeau came with his uh, three kids and uh, sat uh, almost in the front row together with Mayor Drapeau. And we did the little show at that time. And uh, sitting in the front row, there was young Justin, who of course was destined to become the prime minister. I can't say that he became prime minister because he saw our show, but there you go. There's an association. He saw the show, became prime minister. You can draw your own conclusion. Anyway, at this uh, uh, little exhibit, we also showed uh, how polyurethane forms. Now, polyurethane is a fascinating material. It uh, uh, is made by blending two chemicals together, a so-called polyol and an isocyanate, and this forms a foam. It starts bubbling over like a mushroom and then hardens. There are many applications uh, for this. And even back then, my idea was always to uh, get audiences interested in the practical applications of, of, of chemistry. So I spoke about polyurethane, explained how this uh, foam could be used to stuff mattresses and pillows. And this was also at the time when Miss Piggy was at the height of her fame. And I explained uh, her anatomy that Miss Piggy was actually made of polyurethane foam. Uh, some people were disappointed by that bit of, of knowledge, but, but uh, uh, so it was. Uh, then we went on to discuss how urea formaldehyde as a foam could be used to insulate buildings. And this was a, you know, this was very topical at that time uh, because people were concerned about energy losses and they were insulating. We had come through the 1970s and the energy crisis and people were insulating. Now, this was at a time when there, uh, there was also a concern about, uh, you know, how these foams uh, were being used. And uh, the foam that we were generating was polyurethane. Urea formaldehyde was the one that was controversial because 
if it was improperly applied, it could release small amounts of formaldehyde, which is toxic. But that's not what we were demonstrating. We were demonstrating polyurethane, which could also be used as a foam, could also be used as insulating material. Anyway, at that time, there was a lot of controversy over this, and there were already lawsuits over the supposed poisonous foam, which was urea formaldehyde, not polyurethane. Anyway, one Monday morning, and I remember this very well, I pick up my newspaper, I pick up the Montreal Gazette, and I turn to page three, where the city column was located at that time. And in those days, it was written by Ted Blackman. And it caught my interest because the word chemistry was in the headline. And I start reading and Ted was saying how well people are worried about uh, this insulating material being toxic. There are these chemistry professors at Man and His World trying to put a positive spin on a dangerous material. Well, of course, we were not talking about the same material. Anyway, by about nine o'clock that morning, I had a letter on his desk together with a large polyurethane egg that I had made with a string around it that he could hang around his neck as penance for having laid this scientific egg, for having confused the two materials. And I explained to him that just because two substances look the same, they may both look like foam, it doesn't mean that they are chemically the same. And I gave him an analogy. I said, look, you can have a glass of clear liquid and uh, it can be water or it can be vodka or it could be concentrated sulfuric acid. You can't tell, they would look the same. And I think he, he got the message. He liked the analogy between water and vodka. Anyway, uh, what happened was that the next day he did something that journalists very rarely do. He printed a mea culpa article in which he described the real problem here was not polyurethane. In fact, the real problem wasn't even urea formaldehyde. The real problem was that he had skipped too many chemistry classes in high school and he did not appreciate that two substances could look the same and be totally different in their chemical properties. So he gave us kudos for explaining all of this. And I thought that's great. And I also thought that this was it, you know, this is where you know, the story would stop. Well, it didn't stop because the next day I got a call from radio station CJD from Helen Goujon. And some of you will remember Helen, she used to do the morning show in those days. And she wanted me to come on the air and talk about this controversy. So I said, sure, I mean, I can do that, but there's no controversy here. And I explained it, you know, the same way that I basically explained it to you here. And she liked the way I explained it. And the next week there was some other chemical question that came up and they asked me to come on again and explain it. And then pretty soon they offered me to do this on a regular basis. And uh, this started 42 years ago. And now, of course, it's become the longest running radio show on chemistry in, in world history. Of course, it may be the only radio show on chemistry in world history. Anyway, it started back then, which is painfully obvious, of course, only because you see the dial telephone in the picture. And uh, so I started answering questions from callers about all kinds of you know, interesting things. And I don't remember the very first question that I was asked, but I do remember the second question because let me tell you, that was memorable. You know, I was a little bit nervous in those days and I was, you know, trying to listen very carefully. And I thought I heard the caller ask this rather intriguing query. So I didn't know what this was all about. You know, you start to have all these mental images of strange juxtapositions going through your mind. But then luckily the caller realized that he had spoken quickly and he had forgotten a word and that word was golf. Because what he was worried about was pesticide residues on golf courses. Because as I was to learn, sometimes golfers uh, who are very superstitious have the habit of picking up the golf ball and kissing it before putting it back down and whacking it again. 
And he had read about the fact that there were all kinds of pesticides that were used on golf courses. And he was concerned that the ball may have picked up some residue and that he would be transferring this to his lips. Not a totally illegitimate uh, question. So we talked about this and I sang to him the anthem of toxicology that I have done many times since then, which is that only the dose makes the poison. You always have to put numbers into the equation. You have to start thinking about what the extent of exposure is. So I said, look, the amount of pesticide residue that could be found on a golf ball that could transfer to your lips, uh, I think would be inconsequential. But I also said, look, uh, there's better things in life to go around kissing than golf balls. So <laughs> if you have this concern, it's an easily solvable problem. Just don't kiss your golf ball. But I tell you what was interesting about, uh, about that question is when I was first asked to do this show, uh, I thought that I would get the, you know, the usual kind of questions that, that you expect from chemistry. You know, what is aspirin? How does it work? Uh, what is the best kind of wall paint? Uh, you know, how do you remove uh, a rust stain from, from fabric? Uh, what are the components in, in cosmetics? You know, these are the kind of questions which, which uh, I mean, I do get, and, and obviously they're interesting questions, but almost from the first day, a large proportion of the questions was in the vein of this golf ball question. That is, is such and such toxic or is this safe? Can I eat this? It was always a question of a worry about some chemical that they've encountered in the environment having an effect on their health. Uh, so this, this is the, the connection that most people make of, of chemistry. And it's usually is a negative connection about some chemical causing some health problem. And that is the theme really that has continued for 42 years. I mean, I still get those kind of, of questions, but of course I get many others, you know, legitimate, interesting questions as well. <clears throat> anyway, the, the, um, uh, the show has uh, now been on as, like I said, uh, for uh, 42 years. And uh, of course you can listen uh, every Sunday uh, you can listen on whatever device you have. These days, you know, it's, it's no problem. You don't need a dedicated uh, radio. You can just use your phone and you just go to cjd.com and you can listen uh, live. And uh, for an hour every Sunday afternoon, we have what I think is an interesting discussion about what is happening in the world of science, about uh, how we should think about it, about what the risks are, what new developments have there been, um, et cetera. Well, over the years, of course, I've had uh, all kinds of fascinating questions. I mean, starting with the one that, you know, I just uh, described uh, to you, uh, but there've been so many. For example, I was asked, what is the safest way to burn a laminated picture? <laughs> Well, you, at first, you know, you hear something like that. You don't know what this is, where it's coming from. So, of course, uh, you know, I start asking questions from a caller about what this is all about. Well, it turns out that there had been a divorce. And I guess it was a rather uh, unfriendly divorce. And this lady did not want any remnants of her former hubby around. And there was a picture of him that was there in their living room. She didn't want it, but as a picture that had been laminated, meaning that, you know, there was a plastic covering uh, on it. Well, her inclination was to throw this into the fireplace, let him burn, as she told me. But she was also concerned because she had some scientific knowledge and she knew that it was not such a smart thing to be burning plastics. I think she had heard about polyvinyl chloride, PVC, a very commonly used plastic, which indeed should never be incinerated because when uh, it is, it will break down and release dioxins, which are notoriously toxic substances. So she was actually concerned that in the process of burning the former husband's picture, she might inadvertently do harm to herself. So she wanted to know what is the safest way to burn a laminated picture. 
Uh, so I said, look, <laughs> uh, there really is no big risk here because that laminate is not polyvinyl chloride. Uh, it actually is a material we call a polyester. And um, it is a thin layer of plastic that covers the, the picture. Uh, polyester is what we call a thermoplastic polymer, meaning that it softens when it is heated and uh, it can be molded into whatever shape and then that shape is maintained when it cools down. So the idea is to take the picture, take some uh, polyester that has been heated up, it becomes very soft and flexible, that's used to stretch over the picture. And when the polyester cools down, uh, you get a clear layer of uh, polyester that is bonded to, to the picture. I mean, this is the way lamination is, is done. And uh, so I said, look, uh, uh, it's not PVC, so that you don't have to uh, worry about this. And uh, when polyester burns, it just releases carbon dioxide and, and water. But don't worry, the amount that would be released of carbon dioxide is not going to have an effect on, uh, you know, on, on, on climate change. So uh, even though you know, at first it looked like kind of a strange question, it did get into a discussion of some uh, interesting uh, aspects of, of, of chemistry. I'm not sure what she ended up eventually doing with that uh, picture, whether she uh, burned it or not, but uh, I know that she, she was determined to get uh, rid of that. So there is the, no dearth of you know, uh, interesting uh, uh, questions that, uh, that, that are asked. And uh, I mean, this, uh, this lady just considered her husband to be toxic waste and wanted to get rid of the, the, the picture. Another caller told me that she had recently seen the movie, The Help, very, very good movie. And there's a scene when someone ate pie that had human feces in it. And uh, this is, uh, you know, it was a, a quick little storyline in the, in the movie, but very, very uh, interesting. And uh, so she wondered, you know, whether or not this is dangerous or, or whatever, is it safe to try this on someone? Well, I don't know who she wanted to uh, try this on, now it is true that the movie did have this uh, this little storyline in it, uh, where someone was going to get revenge by putting uh, fecal matter into into the pie. Well, obviously, eating fecal matter is not to be recommended. Why? Because it is chock full of bacteria. Uh, not all of these are disease causing, but you never know where the matter came from. And I mean, this is a continuing concern. Because, for example, when animals are slaughtered, you know, the insides can contaminate the outsides and everything gets messed up so that you can have some fecal residue in meat. I know it doesn't sound very appetizing and of course it would not be visible, but there's always that possibility because of the way that the animals are slaughtered. But generally this is not an issue because you cook the food and the bacteria are, are killed. Uh, but um, obviously there's meat inspection and uh, uh, it's rare that you find contamination, but I mean, it can happen. But anyway, when she wants to know if it is safe to put this into someone's food, I mean, the answer of course is no, this is not something that you should be uh, doing. I don't know who she wanted to, to feed that uh, uh, fecal pie to, but I guess she had someone who she was upset with and uh, wanted to basically get back at them without killing them. Anyway, uh, my advice was no, uh, don't do it. Don't put fecal matter into, into the pie. And someone else uh, got concerned because of a warning that they had seen on some uh, ear pods that uh, they had purchased. And uh, indeed, uh, I, I can understand the concern here because she was looking at the earbuds and there it is, warning, this product contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects or other reproductive harm. Not something that you really want to see. 
Now that uh, California Proposition 65 is, is uh, somewhat uh, of an enigma. Uh, the intent is pretty sound. They want to warn people about substances that may be toxic, but, but it really does go overboard. Uh, in this case, the warning is on there, I suspect, because there is some lead solder that is used inside of the, uh, of the earphones. And lead is on the list of chemicals that requires a Proposition 65 warning because ingestion of lead, even small amounts of lead, of course, is a problem. But in this case, nobody's talking about eating these earbuds, but there's no such distinction. According to that Proposition 65, if there is lead in a consumer product that you have to, you have to put this warning on there. So no, I don't think that there's any problem with the earbuds, uh, but obviously the advice is, do not eat them. Another interesting question was about birdseed. Uh, the caller was concerned, having noticed that she had bought a, uh, a bag of seed, which the birds do not seem to, to like. And I guess she had been accustomed to uh, using different kinds of birdseed, but she found this sample. So, can you please analyze the sample to see if there is something wrong with it? Well, there's something wrong with that question. Now, I don't know whether or not there may have been, you know, something with that bird seed. I mean, maybe something got mixed in there and, and the birds really didn't like it. I don't know. I mean, that was impossible to determine. But the reason that I mentioned this particular question is because I've been asked so many times over the years in different contexts, if you could analyze this. Well, to analyze something is a very, very complex chemical undertaking. To determine the composition of a substance, especially something like birdseed, which would contain dozens and dozens of naturally occurring compounds. I mean, this would be a huge undertaking. Yes, it could be done. I mean, one could carry out a, a study to see what is in there. It would take days and days and days of analysis and subjecting this to gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. Obviously, this is not something that one would do for suspect birdseed. So the, the idea that you could easily analyze uh, something uh, is, um, is something that, that people just don't understand. It, it's not an easy thing to do with chemical analysis. It's, it's actually uh, very difficult, very complicated. And uh, so, uh, you know, of, of course, what uh, I would have to tell her in, in, in this case is that, look, uh, I understand that there, there is a, a concern here and uh, that uh, you know, uh, with uh, uh, the birds, you know, if animal lovers might be concerned that there may be something wrong, but this is not something that we can easily determine in, in the laboratory. An even more interesting question, I, I think, was how do you get rid of the smell of goats in a house? I don't know why this guy had goats in the house, but he did. For some reason he had, I don't know if it was a pet or he was using it for milk or whatever, but he wanted to know how you get rid of the smell of goats in a house. Well, let me tell you, this is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, goat scent is terrible. Uh, it's not one compound, it's a mixture of compounds. Caproic and caprylic acids are the, are, are the main ones. And if you've ever smelled a wet goat, uh, you know, this is just horrific. I mean, even goat cheese smells pretty bad, but just imagine that multiplied hundreds of times. So he wanted to know how you get rid of this goat smell in the house. So it's difficult, but it can be done. Uh, bad smells can be eliminated with the use of ozone, uh, an ozone generator. And ozone is a gas that will oxidize all kinds of compounds in, in, in the air. But you don't want to be in the room when you use an ozone generator, because ozone can also be harmful to the lungs. So we got into this, we explained it. And then I also mentioned that, you know, there are other connections that people use ozone, which are dangerous. Uh, there is a whole movement out there that claims that ozone 
injected, believe it or not, rectally is a treatment for disease. This is just absolute nonsense. There's no scientific evidence for this whatsoever. We're talking about sort of flaky medical advice. I've had a lot of questions about Dr. Oz over the years. And um, we, he uh, came on the air back in 2009. Uh, Oprah, of course, organized it all. And in the beginning, he was pretty good. But then within a few years, he was uh, being accused by his colleagues of being a quack, of being a snake oil salesman. Because he was mixing sound science with some nonsense. At first, he talked about the benefits of exercise and a proper diet. But when you got to fill five hours of network television a week, you start to get into some, some flaky stuff. And I was really turned off when he got into homeopathy. Uh, homeopathy is the most absurd of all the alternative therapies out there because it is based on non-existent molecules having an existing effect. I mean, homeopathy is, is just giving people pure water uh, and imagining that that water has some sort of magical quality because it has been imprinted with the image of a molecule. I mean, it is totally absurd. And then he got into to all kinds of miracles, you know, about red palm oil for longevity and about diets and miracle pills that burn fat fast and green coffee bean extract, the answer to weight loss. Uh, so he was a mix of some sound science and a lot of, of really nonsense. And uh, doctors became very concerned because people were coming into their offices asking for things that Oz had recommended, which uh, really didn't have any scientific uh, basis. So no, I did not have a high opinion of Dr. Oz when I was asked repeatedly questions uh, about him. And now, as, as you probably know, he is venturing into politics. And um, now he has, uh, as far as I'm concerned, totally gone off the deep end because he has bought into uh, Trumpism and that the election was stolen, etc. But as you can see, he is using the logo from his TV show to promote himself. So he is uh, really using his television career's background to try to get into, into the Senate. And uh, of course, it's, it's becoming a battle. He's, he's being uh, you know, accused of being a huckster, a scammer, um, et cetera. It's gonna be interesting to see how this, uh, this works out. Uh, he's, uh, as I said, he's kind of an enigma because he's obviously a properly trained cardiac surgeon. And yet uh, he has recommended some totally unscientific um, approaches to, to healthcare. Or oh, some of the other interesting questions I was asked, why did my jar of buttons catch fire? Someone, I guess, collected buttons and caught fire. Uh, it wasn't clear how that happened, but the kind of buttons that would catch fire are ones that are made of celluloid. Celluloid was one of the world's first plastics. It's actually based on cellulose nitrate, and it is actually very, very flammable. At one point, collars uh, and cuffs and shirt bosoms were made of, uh, of celluloid. You didn't change your shirt, you just changed the parts that were clearly visible. And uh, uh, this was highly flammable. And I suspect that if someone was collecting uh, these things, then uh, uh, if they said somehow a flame came close to it, it could catch uh, uh, fire. But I never really got um, much information about how this button fire started also asked about uh, kissing a dead body. Is it safe to do this? Because as you know, uh, in some, um, some funerals, there's an open casket and uh, some people will bend all down and, and kiss the dead body and someone want to know if this was uh, safe. Well, I think it is uh, safe enough. Uh, there's not going to be anything transferred, but um, don't expect a uh, a kiss to bring that dead body uh, back to life. All right, sticking still with, uh, with death. Another question I had was, how do you open a cremation urn that has been epoxied? And uh, this was a bit of a challenge because epoxy glue is very difficult to, um, 
to undo. And I suspect what they wanted eventually was to sprinkle uh, the ashes uh, somewhere. And um, uh, eventually we did manage to uh, op open it and it turned out that turpentine really was the key uh, to that. Then I had a question about how do you remove a mustache from a cabbage patch doll? <laughs> and believe it or not, in this case, I actually had to make a house call. And it turned out, this, this was when the Cabbage Patch dolls just came out and they were very popular. And the lady had stood in line at Eaton's to buy the Cabbage Patch doll for her, her daughter. And I guess her son didn't like the daughter to be so happy. And he took a, a, a marker and he painted a mustache on this pure, poor doll. And this little girl was just devastated. So I, I really couldn't give much of advice over the phone. So I actually went out uh, with a couple of solvents, which we, we tried and uh, with ethyl acetate, who were actually able to remove that uh, mustache and make the little girl happy. Well, sticking still with dolls, <laughs> I had another similar question. How do you remove lipstick from the face of Barbie? Well, I never had actually contemplated that people would be putting lipstick on a Barbie doll. And indeed, it turned out that that wasn't the case. What had happened was that the lips of the doll had chipped and uh, the doll collector, uh, and there are many Barbie doll collectors, tried to fix this chip in the lipstick uh, with a red marker. Well, it turned out that that ink soaked into the flesh and uh, the flesh of Barbie is made of polyvinyl chloride, which is very absorbent. And this became a, a, a horrible stain. And was, it was so bad that even Ken couldn't stand to, uh, to look at this. This time I was not so successful. Uh, when we tried uh, with Q-tips and different solvents, uh, but the fact is that the PVC here was porous and the, uh, the dye had seeped into, into the flesh. So this was not a solvable problem. Not all problems can be solved by chemistry. And someone else wanted to know if it is true that margin is one molecule away from plastic. There was an email widely circulating. I suspect some of you may have even seen this about the difference between butter and margin. And uh, it was, you know, basically uh, to show that butter was better than margarine because margarine was depicted as some kind of synthetic commodity. One mo molecule away from plastic. What does this mean? Is this, this true? No. Uh, margarine is made of fats, vegetable fats, and chemically speaking, they, these are what we call triglycerides. Fatty acids linked to a backbone of glycerol. It is a totally different substance from plastics. Plastics are long polymers, long chains of molecules. There's no chemical similarity between margarine and, and plastics. I don't even know where this comes from. But this whole idea of something being one molecule away from something else, it doesn't make sense. I mean, how, putting it to context, I mean, one could say that if you take ethylene, which is a gas, and you react it with water under the right conditions, you can convert it to ethanol. Now ethanol, of course, is that's the alcohol we have in beverages, completely different substance from ethylene. You could say that ethylene is one water molecule away from ethanol, but it really doesn't have any, any meaning. Uh, so, I mean, th this whole idea of, of margin being one molecule from plastic is, 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 is just uh, total nonsense. Then there was a question of whether or not there is beaver butt in ice cream. This was first raised by the food babe, Vanny Harry, who has coined this expression for herself. The idea being that ice cream, particularly van vanilla ice cream, contains beaver butt extract. No, it doesn't. It turns out that beavers do produce a fragrance. They have a gland in the, near their rear end, not their anus, a gland near there that produces various chemicals. Now it is true that these chemicals have been industrially used. 
mostly in the perfume industry because at very low concentration, they can have a pleasant smell. Also, it is possible to take one of these chemicals in the laboratory, convert it into vanillin, but that's not commercially done. No one could make money <laughs> making vanillin, vanilla extract from, from beaver uh, extract. But of course you can tell this story in such a way to frighten people. And in fact, Jamie Oliver, the British chef does exactly that. He gives talks to, to school kids telling them that there's beaver butt extract in their ice cream. No, there is no beaver butt extract in, in the ice cream. Uh, it is true that some of these chemicals can, can be in the laboratory converts to vanillin, but there's no commercial application uh, of that. Um, well, talking about things coming out of the butt, uh, of course, there, there are certain fragrances that can come out of there, obviously. And a uh, number of years ago, uh, two ladies came to me and they had an idea. This, this goes back oh, close to 30 years. And they said that, you know, some people have uh, an issue with, with flatus and the smell that is generated. And they had an idea. They knew that charcoal absorbs smells and they were wondering whether or not it might be possible to somehow impregnate cloth with charcoal to make some sort of underwear that would absorb smell. Well, at that time I thought that this was really, you know, kind of far-fetched and I didn't know of any way that this could be done. And I said, you know, I don't think that this had real commercial possibilities. And, and uh, so I didn't pay much attention and uh, you know, I didn't follow up on this. Well, it turns out that subsequently a number of similar items appeared on the market, uh, including this one here called Subtle Butt, which are these, um, as they say, reusable gas neutralizers. They're pads that are impregnated with, uh, with charcoal. And charcoal indeed is very effective at absorbing gas. So the idea here is to use this on uh, people who are notorious producers of uh, smelly gases and uh, have the charcoal absorb this. So this is now commercially available and it's not the only such product. There are, um, there's actually underwear that has been formulated that has the charcoal built in and there are various kinds of these, these pads. And I suspect that there's a market for this and that they have had some commercial success. So on this one, I guess I would say that uh, I missed the boat because there could have been some commercial success there. So there's a little bit of a view for you into what it's been like, you know, dealing with the public over these, uh, you know, 42 years on the radio. And it's still fun because you never know what kind of question is, uh, is going to get asked uh, next. So I always look uh, forward uh, to it. All right, so uh, if there are any uh, questions, especially of the interesting variety, uh, go ahead and pose them now. There's also this survey that you are being asked to uh, uh, take part in about whether or not we should go back to doing these presentations live or continue on, uh, uh, on Zoom. So it would be good to have some sort of information about that. All right, so I don't see any questions in the chat. Nope. Well, if, oh, hold on. Yes. Uh, from Myra Schuster, ditto on poisonous flowers. How dangerous is it to pick a poisonous flower? Well, you don't want to go around picking poison ivy, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, obviously, but uh, there are really not many poisonous flowers out there that you would normally come into contact with unless you're wandering through the Amazon. 
so what uh, what particular flower would uh, she's saying hemlock hemlock okay uh, hemlock actually touching it is not a problem consuming hemlock juice would be a problem now any flower in specific individuals can be allergenic uh, because you know humans are biochemically individual and have allergies to different things uh, but as a general rule, this is rarely encountered that someone will develop a reaction to, to flowers. I mean, poison ivy, of course, is the, is the classic one. She's saying inadvertently, of course. She was reading about poisonous flowers today. Yeah. Well, don't inadvertently eat any flowers. I think that's it for today. We're getting okay. a thank Very you. Very good. All right. Thank you for thank joining you. us. We'll see you next month. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Joe. Bye.